Okay, good morning. Hopefully everybody's had their dose of coffee. So, um, What I'll do is um, really give you lots of examples of things, and I'll go back and forth between instrumentation, a little bit of conceptual framework, why we do these things, and um, why you would actually want to do these types of measurements and where this technology can go in the future. So first, uh, a disclosure. Of I'm a co-founder. I think all of you know about this company now, Modulated Imaging. Now, time will tell whether or not the, the technology will be a brilliant technology, but I think it probably will have the record for one of the most brilliant taglines ever, everything in modulation. So David Kuchik came up with that. Um, David and Amon are former grad students from my group, and so it kind of gives you a sense. You see this everywhere. I'm sure you see this in your home institutions. There's lots of, I think, more opportunity now to establish commercial ventures, particularly from graduate school, from postdoc, from your postdoctoral fellowship. I think there's significant encouragement for innovation in small companies. Um, it's kind of shifted over time, and it's been very, very interesting for us to see. We also have uh, collaborations with a number of companies as well, and, and that's increasing. It's, a, it's certainly a trend in our field and in many fields, um, and those collaborations really can span many different, they work in many different ways. In, in most of these, we're looking at technology that these companies are developing, and we get to assess it, evaluate it very early on, and provide information and feedback on to how these things work. Uh, and with some of these, there, there are sort of traditional licensing things going on as well. So medical imaging. Um, we're, our field is mostly kind of from a medical imaging point of view. I know that we all think our field is important, but it's oftentimes viewed parenthetically off to the side. It's not a mainstream medical imaging modality. So if you're in radiology, these are the main methods that are used. And if you're a radiologist, those are the ones that you're trained on. Optics is increasingly viewed as a technology that could be used in radiology, but it's really still not there. It's not a standard method that's in radiologic imaging departments all around the country. But optics is clearly standard of care in many, many different areas, many subspecialties and specific application areas. And if you just look overall at the imaging spectroscopy market, it's probably conservatively about a $20 billion a year market worldwide. About a billion of it alone is with OCT, optical coherence tomography, and about a billion or so is in infrared spectroscopy, near-infrared spectroscopies, pulse oximetry, hyperspectral types of technologies. And the rest comes really from endoscopy. So that's sort of the largest of all of the markets. So from an anatomic point of view, anatomic imaging, Optical techniques are standard of care in ophthalmology. Uh, who's, how many of you are working on OCT? So of course you know, so you can come and talk about this right now. You know that OCT is a standard of care technique, one of the fastest growing technologies in ophthalmology. It can give you beautiful resolution, actually of the entire eye from anterior to posterior segments. This is an image, this is a Actually, the spectralis is a system that comes from Heidelberg Engineering. You can see all the retinal nerve fiber layers. All of these different color codings are because of refractive index discontinuities, refractive index changes. So this has been really transformational. You see the foveal pit, high density of cones, photoreceptors there. Um, here's an image that's just a Doppler shifted OCT image. So if you lock into the Doppler shifted scattering signal. OCT is an interferometric imaging technique, so it suppresses multiple light scattering using interferometric gating. So here, this is from Zongping Chen, who's here at BLI. If you just look at that interferometric signal from moving scattering particles, which happen to be erythrocytes in blood vessels, then you can reconstruct the vascular map, the microvascular structures. And this is without any labels, no contrast. So prior to this, the way that people would get vascular structure in the eye is injection of a contrast agent and then using some sort of a flash technique to look at fluorescence. 
So these are really, you know, beautiful techniques designed to look at anatomic structure, widely used throughout medicine. As I mentioned before, OCT is about a roughly a billion dollar market currently. Endoscopic techniques, um, essential for minimally invasive surgeries. So minimally invasive surgery is one of the fastest growing applications of surgery. Image guidance is, ki is critical for that. I think most of you, you guys know about intuitive surgical. Has everybody heard of intuitive but, so raise your hand if you have. Okay. So no amateur investors around here. So it's one of the fastest growing biomedical companies. You could be working for Intuitive Surgical after you graduate and get a job. So it's, uh, it's you've heard of the Da Vinci robot. So it's robotic surgery. And, um, you know, it's really a fast growing company and has initially made a huge impact in urologic surgeries, uh, but it's moving into many, many different areas. So part of the innovation there is in mechanical engineering. You have a robot that can emulate really beautifully how the human hand and wrist works so you can stitch. Um, it's much easier using that sort of robotic approach than having endoscopes, which is sort of like doing surgery with chopsticks in some cases. So it's a really wonderful transformation. They use, as standard of care, has anybody heard of the company Novadac? Novadac? Does anybody think that fluorescence, so the use of exogenous fluorescence probes in image guidance in surgery is a, is a possible, is it, <laughs> is, it, is it coming? Okay, forget about the flashing. So fluorescence guided surgeries, is, has anybody got experience with that? Is anybody working on that? as a research topic, or fluorescence contrast? Is anybody working on fluorescence contrast? Do you think it has prospects for being useful in, in medicine? Not really, because we use autofluorescence during the brain surgery, and light from the room causes a lot of problems. Yeah. Autofluorescence will work on intensity. Yeah. The shape of the brain is not really flat. Yeah. A lot of, uh, you know, uh, processing. Yeah, but, so that's interesting. I just was very interested in your first reaction. And how about you? Do you, do you think fluorescence-guided surgeries are going to be useful? So it might be interesting to you to know that there's a company that's publicly traded called Novadac, and it, I think its stock price is reasonable. It's on the NASDAQ. It's about 18 or $20 per share. And that's their business model. They do fluorescence-guided surgical techniques. They use indocinin green as the contrast agent, which is an FDA-cleared agent. It's widely used. And what's even more amazing is that they're able to survive as a company doing that, selling stuff. But they also have licensed their technology to guess who? Intuitive Surgical. So Intuitive Surgical makes and markets a fluorescence-guided resection approach for looking at vascular perfusion using indocine and green. So it's fluorescence-guided surgery. So it's not just a thing that's coming in the future. It's not just a sort of high-risk area that could develop into something. It's actually an area with a substantial market that's used widely currently in commercial devices. So these are anatomic approaches. These are functional techniques. and. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of like to point out with these functional techniques, which are based on pulse and hemoglobin oximetry, that there's a huge amount of activity in this area. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail coming up. But uh, the hallmarks of these methods, they're not looking at anatomic structure. They're looking at functional change in tissue. They're spectroscopic-based methods. Uh, this is a very beautiful example of one of those. So the Pronto system from Massimo which is a small bedside device. It's a multi-wavelength spectroscopy instrument that's able to recover hemoglobin non-invasively from a patient. So it's a very, very important measurement that otherwise would require extracting blood from the patient and measuring hemoglobin using another instrument away from the patient. And then sort of the classic example of a tissue oximetry device made by Invos, which is now part of Covidian, is this device it's a near-infrared spectroscopy system. It's widely used in brain monitoring. It's in virtually every NICU 
neonatal intensive care and PICU, pediatric intensive care unit in the country. And it's used to monitor brain oxygenation. It's used as a trend monitor. It's not a quantitative instrument, but it's used to inform clinical decisions in premature infants primarily who have immature lungs and may not have oxygen adequately delivered to their brains. So what we're going to talk about today is all functional, so no anatomic. Uh, we do a lot of anatomic stuff as well, but um, that will be in another course. So what do we want to do? Those are, we've got over a $20 billion market, and you know, as Vossen pointed out, I really got lucky coming to the Beckman Laser Institute in the right sort of time. Um, I came in 1988, and uh, there I don't know what the market was for devices. You know, there was very little commercialization going on. We had to, I worked at a national lab, and uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. When we needed lasers, we had to build the lasers. So you got stuff, and you actually machined it, and you assembled the lasers. There's just been this dramatic transformation over time, both in the availability of devices that are able to control, so semiconductor devices that are able to control light sources and instruments, um, as, as well as those light sources themselves. They used to take up entire rooms. You hear people talk about computers that took up a whole room. Well, lasers used to take up a whole room as well, and now they're as big as a grain of sand. You can have three Vixels on top of a small, very, very small device that's overall you know, a few millimeters in dimension. So those are three lasers in one, simple, one package. So this transformation of technology has led to this amazing commercialization and movement of these technologies into various important areas in medicine. Certainly biology as well. I think many of you are familiar with all of the applications of photonics and biology. Most people think of optics as a tool for fundamental biology discovery. And there's not that much that goes on in biology without optics and photonics. But a big part of the story is, so a big part of the story has been this, this transformation to get things to happen in medicine, the movement of these technologies in medicine. So we see all these methods, large market out there. Can it grow? Is this the beginning of the market? Is this the end? In my opinion, and of course I'm really, really biased, this is really just the beginning. We're, we're looking at kind of the start of the growth curve. And what are we going to do in the future? We're going to do better at seeing beneath the surface. Right now, there's a weak understanding of where the signals come from. So when you measure something, everyone in our field is trying to correlate that with some sort of underlying biologic process. Whether you're in Vadim's group and you're looking for alterations in nuclear, in perhaps gene expression, can you measure that optically, condensation of nuclei, uh, predicting whether tissue is malignant or benign uh, without even looking at the tissue explicitly itself? The signals change. We're measuring stuff that's exquisitely sensitive to biological processes, but we're at a very early stage in understanding the meaning of all of that. So we have to work very closely with the field, with biologists, to understand the origin of these signals. And then the next big challenge is Let's say we understand the origin of a signal. What does it actually mean for the patient? Can we link that to clinical outcome? And those are the really big challenges of our field, and that's what we have to do. We have to take these on in order to be able to get devices and technologies out there so that they can impact clinical outcome for patients. So resolution with optical techniques uh, spans from really the nanoscopic regime so nanoscopic imaging methods can go down to as low as about 10 nanometer resolution, those sub-wavelength types of approaches. And there are actually a number of those methods that are now commercialized. Um, up to several millimeters, around a centimeter. And fundamentally, these techniques that are high resolution, that are structural based, nan nanoscopy, microscopy, coherence tomographies, those are all based on the conceptual framework that light is a wave, and we're using a variety of gating strategies to suppress multiple light scattering so you can form coherent images. So that, that includes geometrical gating. I think you're all familiar with confocal microscopy. You use a pinhole as a gating strategy. The idea is to get rid of 
information that can degrade the image that comes from multiple light scattering. Coherence tomographies use interferometric gating, uh, various microscopies, microscopies that use nonlinear gating, so nonlinear excitation is a way also of gating the information selectively to a specific region that's in focus in a laser beam. And then as light goes into tissue, in space and time, you go to a depth of about a millimeter or so, you can't, it's very difficult to overcome multiple light scattering. And it's a, that's a good time to embrace multiple light scattering. So we have a variety of techniques that are based entirely on this idea that we can treat photons as particles or light as a particle. And these methods, many of which you guys are working on in this course right now, include photoacoustic techniques, macroscopic imaging, diffuse tomographies. So here we have a governing model, typically, and these are model-based approaches. So we'll make a measurement, and then we compare to a model, and that allows us to extract quantitative information out of tissue. What's interesting about this whole, if you work in this entire area, is that the contrast from these techniques that are particle-based approaches is conserved across spatial scales. So you're fundamentally looking at the same information content that you're probing when you use high-resolution microscopic imaging approaches. So we'll talk about diffuse tomography now. And this is a more personal view of diffuse optics. So this is me with uh, a few 850 nanometer LEDs in my mouth. And uh, the picture is being taken with a Canon Rebel camera with about a 200 millisecond exposure time. So Canon Rebel is a $200 consumer grade camera, CMOS. The only trick to this, of course, is the IR blocking filter is removed from the camera. So there's a tremendous amount of potential in consumer devices that are out there. And there's also a huge amount of diffuse light that's available to make measurements with. So this light has traveled cent several centimeters. Just to really drill in the point here, there's no external illumination. All the illumination is coming internally in my mouth. It's a completely dark room. Actually, you can see it's kind of spooky how the light is filling up my pupils. You can see some sort of shadow effect over here. Every time I show this to physician colleagues, they always zero in on that, and they want to know what's wrong with me. <laughs> but you know, clearly, there's a huge amount of light in the near infrared that's available for detection as compared to, let's say, MRI, where you're always working with signals that are very close to the noise floor. Of course, MRI images are much more beautiful than this, but this has its own sort of intrinsic beauty to it, spookiness. So this is a kind of, I think in some ways, it's emblematic of the power of multiple light scattering and diffuse optics, but it's also a very, very good illustration of how complex and difficult it is to be quantitative with these techniques. Because if I didn't tell you that the light sources were in my mouth, you would have no idea where the source was because the light is completely randomized. So we need to know the history of the photons. We need to know the path length of the photons. And that's how we can be quantitative about measuring what's inside. Why is there a shadow over here? Do I have a sinus blockage? Do I have some sort of abnormality? Or is it just something on the surface that's actually attenuating the light. So in that type of image, there is contrast that comes from endogenous chromophores. And I think all of you guys are familiar with this now, so I won't dwell on it very much. But this is sort of the big picture of relative absorbance or attenuation as a function of wavelength. And you see that light scattering is comparable to absorption in wavelengths that are roughly less than about 600 nanometers or so. And then light scattering behavior falls off like me scattering, 1 over lambda, whereas at shorter wavelengths, it's about 1 over lambda to the 4, more Rayleigh influenced, where there are very small particles with respect to the optical wavelength. And as we move to longer wavelengths, the wavelength itself is comparable to the size of the scattering particle. So you have a flattening of scattering, and there's a big difference between the probability of light scattering and the probability of light absorption because the dominant absorbers, hemoglobin in tissue, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, are falling off in their molecular extinction coefficients. So the efficiency of light absorption is reduced substantially. 
Light scattering is leveling, so multiple light scattering dominates, and you can get a lot of light through tissue in this regime. And if you focus in this regime, you see that you know the traditional, you're very familiar with the deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin spectra, the crossing point, which we call the isospestic point. But there's also lots of other stuff in the near infrared that's potentially available to quantify and detect in tissues. So we primarily focus on lipid absorption and water absorption. Now these are not electronic absorption features. They're actually harmonics of fundamental infrared vibrations. So the water absorption comes from an OH, bend and stretch mode. It's actually a combination overtone. And you can see, even see the disposition of those water states. So if those vibrations are asymmetric and harmonic, if they're bound, for example, to heavy proteins, you'll see changes in the bandwidth and the peak position of that water peak. And the same thing is true for lipid. So this is a CH stretch. So depending upon the environment of the lipid, the environment of the water, people like to use those spectroscopic features to identify the environment or the disposition of those, those components of molecules. And we, we actually are very, very interested in doing that type of spectroscopy. So the challenge is, if we're going to be quantitative and measure the composition of tissue, all those constituents, then we need to measure the optical path length. So this is the thought experiment that I think you're all familiar with. If you take a cuvette and you shine light in it and it's transparent, you know the path length. That's essential in using Beer's law to calculate the concentration. This is typically one centimeter in a spectrophotometer. But if I have a turbid material, like my head, I don't know the path length. I have to calculate that somehow. If I could, then I could determine the concentration. So what are the techniques and why do we want to measure optical path length? Just to sort of repeat this again, because it's extremely important. From a physics point of view, if we can measure path length, we can separate light scattering from absorption. So that's a pretty big payoff. And it allows us to then potentially, if we make lots of measurements, localize information in 3D or do tomography. From a physiology point of view, the practical value of this is we can measure perfusion and metabolism at depth. So we could localize, we can be quantitative, and we can localize that information in bulk tissues at depth. We can also determine the concentration of these other absorbers or fluorophores, for example, water, lipid, any exogenous dye or particle that you may be using. And a very practical uh, benefit for all of this, many people are using fluorescence and fluorescence-guided techniques. There's a huge amount of activity in this all over the world, molecular probes, molecular imaging based on fluorescence. But most of the time, in fact, virtually all of these, people are just simply accepting that fluorescent signal. They're not correcting it for tissue optical property distortions. So they're not getting a real view of what the fluorophore is and the real information content. It's actually distorted. So you need to know the tissue optics in order to correct for that. And just as sort of a simple cartoon illustration, if these are my intrinsic tissue optical properties with wavelength dependence of scattering and absorption, if this is my pure fluorescence emission spectrum, and I will, and these are my absorption and scattering characteristics, I'll have a detected signal in tissue that's very distorted, spectrally distorted, and I'll have the wrong information content. So if I can account for the intrinsic properties, I can get the proper full information content. So let's get back to controlling path length. There are three fundamental ways to do this. So the first way is to control wavelength. So what I have plotted on the y-axis is the mean path length as a function of wavelength. And what you see in regions where absorption and scattering lengths are comparable, that the path length in tissue is really very short, a few millimeters. And then as we go through this regime around 600 nanometers, where we have scatter-dominated light propagation, where absorption lengths may be 10 centimeters and scattering lengths are about 20 to 40 microns, the path length can increase really dramatically by a factor of 10 or even more, 10 or 20-fold. So that's a huge change that you could, on the one hand, think is a problem, but it's actually a really great way to manipulate information content and localize things in tissue in space. So this is a powerful modulator of path length. And interestingly, 
as you might expect, even when we're looking in this multiple light scattering regime, if the tissue is changing, so if there is metabolism actively going on, here's a, a simulation going from 50% saturation oxygenation to 100% oxygenation, the path length can change by another factor of two or so. So you need to really know these path lengths in order to be able to be quantitative about your measurements. And here's a very dramatic illustration. I like these personal illustrations. So here's me again. And I'm being illuminated with two different wavelengths of light. So this is 400 nanometer illumination. This is 850 nanometer. Here, absorption lengths and scattering lengths are equal. And here, absorption lengths are you know, much, much greater than scattering lengths. That's that, eight fi that magic 850 that I was internally illuminating myself with. So what, what does the contrast come from here? Why do I actually, see, why can you see stuff? Absorption in your skin. Absorption in my skin. Can we be more specific? Uh, melanin, I guess. melanin, melanin. Where is the melanin? Very How, let's uh, be even more quantitative. So absorption in my skin, you've got epidermis floating on top of dermis. And right in between, you have this epidermal dermal junction and you've got these cells called basal cells that have lots of melanin around them. Well, maybe not that much, but I certainly don't have that much. But it looks like I have a lot over here. So how deep is that? <laughs> Good deduction. So, <laughs> um, so it's really in me, and we've measured this with multi-photon microscopy, in me it's 50 microns. So my melanin layer is 50 microns deep. So almost all the contrast that you see from this image at 400 nanometers is coming from about 50 microns deep in my tissue. What about over here? Scattering lengths and absorption lengths are you know, widely disparate. So the light goes in, it basically goes right through the melanin, although, of course, there is some attenuation. But fundamentally, I'm looking at multiple light scattering, an image that's got this beautiful glow, <laughs> and I don't see any of these imperfections, all these alterations that are so visible with using high contrast, not very deep penetrating blue light. So this is one way to actually look better. You could also use some sort of particle-based makeup to enhance multiple light scattering, and that's what that industry actually does. They really focus on the development of those materials. So that's a very dramatic illustration, I think, of how there is strong wavelength-dependent path length in tissue. The second major way to control path length is in space. So if absorption lengths are about 10 centimeters in the near-infrared, and scattering lengths are 20 to 40 microns, then if we can make a spatially resolved measurement, we can have differential sensitivity to those two processes. So if I have a light source and a detector very close to it, compared to a light source with a detector that's very far away, and plot that behavior, then you'll see, and this is of course, actually I should say, if mo I think a lot of these plots that came from VP. <laughs> they came from exactly the software that you guys are using. So you see the reflectance is a function of source detector separation. In this regime, very close to the source, you have scatter-dominated behavior. And in this regime, very far away from the source, you have scattering and absorption that are contributing to the, the distance-dependent decay of that signal. So these are very different behaviors dominated by different uh, uh, physical events in the tissue. And by looking at, the, at that entire uh, source detector separation dependent behavior comparing to a model, you can separate absorption from scattering. And the third way, as you might expect, if you can control space, then you can control time. So if I take an ultra short laser pulse, let's say in the picosecond regime, and I launch it into tissue, the photons that are carried in that pulse are propagating along multiple paths. So if I measure the pulse some distance away, at an early time, then the light has not interrogated as large a volume. The paths are much more limited. At a later time, 
there is a larger volume of interrogation in the tissue. Longer times allow for deeper tissue interrogation. So I'll see dispersion of this pulse. The early part of the pulse is dominated by scattering behavior, and the later part of the pulse, the decay, is dominated by light absorption. Scattering is a length scale and a time scale that's extremely short. So in fact, the time scale for absorption events in tissues are fractions of nanoseconds, and the time scale we call the scattering relaxation time in tissue is on the order of fractions of picoseconds. So how do we get that? We just take the, the, the scattering length or absorption length and just divide it by the velocity of light. And those are the relaxation times. So that's an important concept to recognize that space and time are interconvertible in our way to our ability to devise measurements to separate light absorption from scattering. So kind of a summary of all of this, in these measurements in the real domain, we'll put in some sort of input function. So in time, time resolved methods, that'll be a pulse. We'll look at the dispersion in time. In spatially resolved measurements, we'll input a point and look at how the distance dependent spreading of that point occurs in tissue. I, I could actually have a camera and just image that point of light spreading in space, or I can have multiple light fibers and I could pick up the reflectance as a function of source detector separation. So these are techniques in the real domain. And we work uh, in the frequency domain where if you, you take these arguments and you look at the Fourier transform mathematically, and now think, let's think of the physical experiment. In the frequency domain, rather than looking at a pulse of light in time, we intensity modulate light at a specific frequency in time. So we intensity modulate the light, and then we can change the frequencies. And we can look at the modulation transfer function or the frequency dependent behavior of that intensity modulated light injection in the tissue. And we can do the same thing in space, and that's SFDI, spatial frequency domain. So this is temporal frequency domain, this is spatial frequency domain. So in both cases, the input is some sort of sinusoidal function. It's either varying in time or varying in space. The math, the conceptual framework, everything is the same. And so you know, we started doing this, and um, then we actually went to this, single points, and then David, uh, for his PhD thesis, his sort of big breakthrough was to stop using dots and actually start using lines, which is the exact analogy to using sinusoids in time. So it really is a very convenient way of making these measurements. So let's talk about temporal frequency domain. How do we actually do these measurements? You intensity modulate the light in time. It gets injected into the tissue. What happens when it's in the tissue is you conserve this intensity modulated behavior, but it's damped, and these are what we call photon density waves. So they're propagating, they're scalar waves, they propagate with a phase velocity that's determined by the absorption and scattering properties of that multiple scattering tissue or medium. So they're substantially slowed down compared to the velocity of light. And then if you have, let's say, a detector on the same side from where you launch the source, or it can actually be anywhere. It can be in transmission geometry, reflectance geometry. We modulate that light in the megahertz to gigahertz regime. The detector will measure the difference in phase and amplitude between the wave that we launched in and the one that we detect. And this is basically what an experimental output will look like. So here's the phase versus frequency, the amplitude versus frequency, and we fit the reason why these dots have solid lines through them is they're fit to a model. The model comes from a diffusion approximation to the Boltzmann transport equation that you guys are all working with now. And from those fits, we're able to recover separately the absorption and the scattering. So it's essential that we have some nonlinear behavior because these are all nonlinear models. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Well, right here. So just this is... Uh, sort of a glimpse, I won't go into a lot of detail, into this conceptual framework of the photon density wave, which applies in 
time here, but you can also use this basic framework to describe waves that are spreading out or blurring in space. So we have complex waves, complex wave number. They're not electromagnetic. They're scalar waves. So if we look at frequency omega versus k behavior of these waves, we see that the real component actually has this very nice, interesting phenomenon. So the AC penetration depth of the wave is equal to 1 over kr. So at low frequencies, this falls out to the DC penetration depth. So what this means is, as we go to higher and higher frequencies, we have more and more superficial penetrance. So I can change the penetration depth of the wave just by changing the modulation frequency. The same thing with the DC scalar waves in spatial frequency domain imaging. I'll show you some examples of that. So I can increase the frequency, I get more shallow penetrance. I reduce the frequency, and ultimately my limit is the DC penetration depth. Where does this sort of transformation behavior begin to occur? It begins to occur at frequencies that are, that are equal to the reciprocal of the absorption loss relaxation time. So the absorption loss time is the key factor that you need to think about in terms of understanding what frequencies you need to sample in frequency domain photon migration. So you take an absorption coefficient, you divide it by the light, velocity of light, you take the reciprocal of that. That's the, absorp that's the absorption loss relaxation time. So in this simulation, this is about 200 megahertz for these particular parameters, absorption and scattering. The phase velocity of light, when the frequency is much less than this omega, the reciprocal loss relaxation time, then the, there is a... Uh, the phase velocity is independent of frequency, or it's linear with frequency. And so it's fixed, basically, and we're not sampling that dispersion of the phase velocity. So at these low frequencies, you see this very nice linear behavior. So what we need to do is get to higher frequencies, and we're going to see an omega to the one-half dependence. And this omega to the one-half dependence is where the dispersion kicks in. So we want to be sampling right around this dispersion regime in order to adequately recover absorption and separate it from scattering. So there's also a wavelength associated with photon density waves. And the wavelength is much, much less than the actual wavelength of the modulated wave in air. So in a sense, it's kind of like a near-field measurement where the scattering in the tissue reduces the wavelength, reduces the phase velocity of the wave. It maintains that intensity-modulated form so we can detect the phase and the amplitude of it. And we use those changes in phase velocity and modulation wavelength in the tissue in order to be able to quantitatively characterize the medium. So it's really all about characterizing the wave behavior. So there are analogous arguments that you, you've heard of the spatial frequency domain approach where you can project patterns of light and look at the blurring of these patterns. From a practical point of view, you can demodulate these images looking at images that are taken at different phase angles of the patterned projection and at different frequencies. So there are two major consequences to this. So we just described tissue essentially as being a low-pass filter. The low-frequency waves penetrate more deeply. The high-frequency waves are attenuated more rapidly. There's a, a, a rate of attenuation of the high-frequency waves that limits their penetrance. So this allows us to separate absorption from scattering and also localize structures in 3D in tissue. And this is a graphic illustration of that in the spatial frequency domain, but this exactly sort of same concept applies to the temporal frequency. Low frequency waves have greater penetrance. High frequency waves are more superficial. And if you go back into the real domain, let's get out of the frequency domain, because if you're not used to it, it can be mind-boggling sometimes. If you just have your source and detector fibers, you know that if you have a detector that's very far away from a source, that's mostly interrogating deeper structures. Whereas if you have your detector 
close to a source, the sensitivity map is for more superficial structures. So this is exactly the same thing. It's the transformation of that into a different geometry, wide field, with the projection of planar waves onto a tissue. High frequency waves are just like having a source and detector very close to each other. Low frequency waves, they're far apart. And just in the demodulated image, you can see the power of this approach. So these are four different tubes buried in tissue, or a tissue simulating phantom. And what you can see is, with this simulation, or actually these are real measurements, here's the projection pattern at different frequencies. And as we get to the highest frequency, you only see demodulated fluorescence from the most superficial tube. We'll run it one more time. So this is uh, real time, projection patterns, changing frequencies, demodulated fluorescence. So we suppress the information content from the deeper tubes. And this is also really kind of powerfully seen. We'll come back to this image of myself. So this is the difference between very superficial penetrating optical wavelengths, 400 nanometers and 850 nanometers. What if at that same wavelength, 850, I just change the modulation frequency? I can actually change the sensitivity map of my image. So here I am at 0.2 per millimeters. So this is not that high of a frequency, but it's enough to control the path length. And you can see contrast coming from different sources. So this looks entirely different from this, this is still 850 nanometer light. But the first image I showed you, this is at zero spatial frequency. This is at 0.2 per millimeter. So we're controlling path length. So we can use this type of approach to get physiologic information content, quantitative physiology. So here is Mi Mihaela Balu. I guess she is on vacation this week right now, so you didn't have a chance to meet her, but you can see her arm. So here's her physiology. Uh, here's her bracelet. This is a spatial frequency domain image that was taken at multiple wavelengths, multiple frequencies. We calculate absorption and scattering, and then calculate oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. And this is with a cuff occlusion. So our favorite perturbation, there's lots of information content here. So here's where the cuff goes on. This is the oxyhemoglobin, and this is the deoxyhemoglobin image. So immediately you can see the power of the approach. You, you can, it's scalable. You can get information content in every pixel. When the cuff goes on, and this is an arteriovenous cuff occlusion, so there's no blood flowing in and there's no blood coming out. You see there's an increase in deoxyhemoglobin, and that's occurring at the expense of oxygenated hemoglobin. So oxy goes down. So this rate of increase is her intrinsic metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. And then when you release the cuff, there's actually, let's see if I can freeze it. So when the cuff is released, there's this reperfusion effect where oxygenated blood goes back into the tissue and there's an overshoot over baseline. And then eventually there's a relaxation of these back down to baseline. So there's a huge amount of information content that we use in order to deduce something unique about her physiology, individual physiology from this. Anybody have any idea what mediates the overshoot? Just take a wild guess. So you release the cuff. What are the factors that are controlling vascular perfusion? So reperfusion. OK, why is there reperfusion? What is, what is controlling that? Blood flow. So what's controlling the blood flow? <laughs> cardiac, I don't think her cardiac output is changing really in that period of time. Local vasoreactivity. Uh, so that's endothelial cell modulated. So your endothelial cells are really controlling that function. 
So as soon as you release the cuff, endothelial cells are reacting to the shear stress. There's nitric oxide release. There's vasodilation. There's reperfusion to the tissue. So it's a really simple test of vascular reactivity and endothelial cell function. It's still kind of open in our field to be able to correlate those types of endothelial cell function tests to underlying disease processes. But it's very, very clear that there is significant variation between individuals in the time scale of those events, the amplitudes of the change. So are we officially now testing whether or not that, OK. Let's look for modulation. Um, and so this is her own characteristic reperfusion and relaxation time. So there's a huge amount of information content in those types of measurements. So just to sort of summarize, we have temporal modulation techniques. These are typically done with contact fibers on the tissue, where we're injecting light that's intensity modulated. We're looking at very deep tissues. So the sensitivity map of contact fibers is different than non-contact planar illumination onto tissue. Our sensitivity map with this approach is roughly up to 10 centimeters in transillumination geometry through breast tissue. That's sort of the approximately, with current detectors, that's the best that you can do right now. In reflectance geometry with source detector separations that are three or four centimeters, you can go two or three centimeters into tissue with your main sensitivity map. But you guys can actually visualize that very nicely now that you're experts in all the virtual photonics tools. So if we spatially modulate with non-contact approaches, we have a planar geometry, and our sensitivity map is probably around five millimeters in, t in tissue. It depends on the tissue. In principle, you can be sensitive to things that are about a centimeter in depth. It depends on the detector. It depends on the actual tissue optical properties. So we can resolve things that are about a centimeter here with temporal modulation. Um, actually, we can see changes of things that are on the several millimeter scale. But if you want to do tomography and you're looking in very thick tissues, then it's about a centimeter resolution. If you want to resolve structures in the spatial frequency domain, resolution is dependent on the depth. But we've actually done tomography, solving an inverse scattering problem, and have been able to resolve structures that are on the order of a millimeter or even less using that approach. So we won't go into that, but there's, we've published a variety of papers on how you can actually see structures that are less than a millimeter in dimension, which is a little counterintuitive since it is the diffusion regime. But because of the geometry and the way that this information is collected, it has interesting potential for depth resolution uh, uh, on those scales. So which one of these things do you want to use? Well, we're going to go into a lot of detail now on the contact fiber-based approach. And I want to come back to sort of this whole issue of commercialization. So, so you need to have commercialization in order for these technologies to have an impact in patients. And as I mentioned earlier, when I first started doing this stuff in the 80s, there was very little market. Now there's a billion dollar or so market. There are a number of near-infrared oximetry companies that are both point probes and imagers. This is an incomplete list. So there's actually probably about 30 or so in total FDA cleared devices. Some of them are multiple devices from the same company. But there are many, many FDA-cleared devices, and they all seem to sort of trace back to pulse oximeters. None of these are actually, none of these FDA-cleared devices are time domain or frequency domain. So hopefully that will be coming soon. But there are time domain and frequency domain companies. So um, uh, Hitachi, uh, sorry, um, Hamamatsu actually makes a time domain device, although it's not widely commercially available. Um, probably the most uh, common one is the ISS instrument. That's uh, the Oxyplex. That's a frequency domain device. So they have much different form factors than the ones you see in the laboratory. They're very nice looking. Uh, this is a particularly interesting one, the InfraScan. This is essentially like a stud detector for traumatic brain injury, subdural hematomas. And it's used now in military medicine. It's actually been developed by a group at Penn and Drexel based on patents that came from Brit Chance's lab. So 
it works uh, really nicely to find traumatic brain injury potential uh, before actually that evolves. So what are some interesting clinical results that I've seen and that can potentially help drive the field forward? This is one paper that was done by an anesthesiology group in Germany. And what they did was they, looked at a, they did a 1,200 patient study of patients who were undergoing cardiac bypass surgery. And they looked at their brain oxygenation prior to surgery. So this is not even monitoring during surgery. This is just looking at patients and trying to assess how they may do over time, predicting their future, basically. And what they found was that if their brain oxygenations were greater than 50%, that was very significantly different in terms of outcome. These are survival curves. So if you're, who's, are you, who's familiar has seen survival curves published in the literature? This is the ultimate outcome study, <laughs> actual patient survival. So this is time. This is the survival probability. And what you see is that if your oxygenation, your brain oxygenation, is less than 50%, that your survival probability is 20 or 30% less than if your brain oxygenation is greater than 50%. And if you get stratified into a high-risk group, so looking at other factors before you go into surgery, the power of separating between the two is tremendous. So you really have a pretty impressive predictor just on that one optical measurement for patients who are doing cardiac bypass surgery, whether they'll be alive or dead at one year. So... The idea behind a lot of these techniques is to be able to predict the future. But, you know, we look at those survival curves. They're very impressive. And really, I just have a lot more questions. And the first question that I have is 50% saturation is pretty low. So that's a very low cutoff. So what about the patients who are more than 50%, but maybe less than 70%? It's got to be the majority of the patients, the borderline cases. And... It, it really focuses on this issue. These instruments measure relative saturation. They're not absolute values. Although pulse oc these, these companies, the tissue oximetry companies, will say they're absolute values of oxygenation. But they don't account if there's a variety of changes, for example. It's hard to compare one person to another. It's okay to follow that one person, but it's very, very hard to compare one to another. And so that creates dispersion in this population behavior. So it's then very hard to separate out the people who are 50, 55, 60%. So presumably, more quantitative measurements that allow us to absolutely compare individuals could potentially help us improve outcome for patients. I'm not so sure that you could intervene with this type of behavior prior to surgery. Maybe you could get people who are less than 50% use medical interventions to improve their oxygenation. But I'm not so sure that the instrument itself has fine enough resolution to be able to identify individuals who may benefit from that. And then it also raises the question, are there other optical endpoints that could be used to make clinical decisions? Do these patients also have poor vascular reactivity? How could you measure reactivity? Well, simply, you could do sort of cuff experiments, just like we were, I was just showing you before, and look at their endothelial cell function. Maybe it's related to that. So we've done some work also in anesthesia, and this is using the Oxiplex. It's a quantitative oximetry device. It's frequency domain. And this uh, uh, anesthesiologist, Ling Zhang Meng, who was at UCI at the time, he came to, came to see me, and he said that the biggest problem in anesthesia is that they actually have no idea if patients feel pain. Could we help him try to figure out, is there an optical measurement that determines whether or not a patient is experiencing pain during surgery? It's kind of a scary thought. You know, you're under anesthesia, and they bring a knife out, and they cut you, and they have no idea whether or not you feel that in any sense. So that was kind of the initial focus of these studies. What we found out is that I mean, that's still an important, outstanding question. But there's actually another practical problem in anesthesia. 
when you go under, your blood pressure drops. So your, your, mean, your systolic pressure is dropping and goes down to maybe 60, 70, 80. And so the first thing the anesthesiologist does is they try to restore your pressure. Because if you don't have sufficient blood pressure, you're not getting enough blood flow to your brain. There's only a limit to cerebral autoregulation of blood flow. So they try to restore your pressure. And they do that with pressor agents, agents that change your vascular reactivity. They increase your peripheral vascular resistance. So you get a pressor agent, and they use different ones. And I don't know how they decide which ones to use, but I know which one I would like to have if I'm having surgery. So here's one, phenylephrine. Here's another, ephedrine. This is actually a very, very old agent, ephedrine. This is a little bit newer. But structurally, they're very, very similar. So the phenylephrine, every time a patient gets a bolus injection, you see there's a drop in brain oxygenation. There's also a drop in cardiac output. So cardiac output and mean arterial pressure are being monitored on the patient. And for a variety of reasons, there's actually a drop in oxygenation that goes on. And this occurs every time. So they, they're, they're not, they act over a short period of time. So the anesthesiologist has to monitor the blood pressure and then give more as the pressure starts to drop. But with every injection of that agent, oxygenation goes down. And if you have long, a long surgery, there's a cumulative drop in oxygenation in the brain. And, and other studies have correlated those drops in oxygenation to postoperative cognitive decline using a variety of, of tests. There are a number of tests that you can do. But in the case of ephedrine, actually, you don't see any change in brain oxygenation. And some of this may be related to the rate at which the mean arterial pressure increases. This is much more gradual. This is a rapid increase. It acts rapidly to increase the mean arterial pressure. So that means there can be alterations in, in brain blood flow or perhaps metabolism. So this is not really well teased out that occur to compensate in this case, so you're actually, you don't explode. So naturally, you would have to have a drop, perhaps, in, in brain perfusion. Whereas this more gradual increase in pressure would result in a stable brain oxygenation signal. So of course, this is the agent that I, I prefer to have. And th this has created a lot of interest in the anesthesiology community, and I think is a nice illustration of how these techniques could be used real time to inform clinical decisions. Another area that we're really, really interested in is exercise. Exercise is good for you. It's also probably your only, the only way you can sort of control your own therapy in some sense. It's, it's, uh, and it can be dosed in a very quantitative way. So here are some studies where we have, uh, um, this is a Hamamatsu time-resolved uh, uh, near-infrared spectroscopy instrument. So injecting light pulses, looking at the dispersion of the pulse, separating absorption from scattering using those models. So we have this on prefrontal cortex and a probe on the vastus lateralis muscle. And we also have a metabolic cart going in these studies where we can measure VO2 max and tidal CO2, EKG, and so forth. And this is the type of information that we can recover. So here the subject is resting and then goes into sort of a state of unloaded pedaling, just pedaling without any resistance. And here's the period of ramped exercise, 20 watts per minute until exhaustion. And these tracings are brain oxygenation here. So you can see brain oxygenation is pretty flat. And even through the exercise, it's not changing until at some point it starts to drop. And even when this subject stops exercising, the brain oxygenation is persistently low. Here's muscle oxygenation. And as you would expect, muscles require oxygen in order to work. You'll see extraction of oxygen, a drop in the oxygenation. The muscle is working. This begins to level off as the muscle approaches or undergoes. There's not a single transformation point. There is a shift from aerobic to anaerobic metal uh, metabolism, so more glycolytic. So there's the extra contribution of glycolytic metabolism, buildup of lactic acid, and this is visible 
in these types of tracings. And then when they stop, you get the same effect as if you release the cuff. You get massive reperfusion of blood back into the compartment. And we can look at this in even more detail. So you can separate oxyhemoglobin from deoxyhemoglobin. So here what we see in the muscle is deoxyhemoglobin rises and then it plateaus. So there's clearly no further extraction going on here. And this is obviously an anaerobic phase, anaerobic dominated phase where there's a significant amount of lactate that's being built up. This is all at the expense of oxygenated hemoglobin, which continues to go down. And then you stop working, and there's reperfusion, and there's a drop in the deoxyhemoglobin. Now, if you focus on the brain, this is really interesting. What you see is, fairly early on, there's an increase in oxyhemoglobin, which is essentially a surrogate for perfusion. So you see this increase in oxyhemoglobin to the brain, and at some point, it actually reverses. And this is around the point where you see that drop in oxygenation because there's a persistent increase in deoxyhemoglobin at some point that's associated with metabolism in the brain. So there, here, the question is, is this a, a consequence of the fact that the blood supply can't meet the metabolic demand? Is the, is the subject in a state of exhaustion at this point? Are they hyperventilating? So are they expelling CO2 really fast so that there's some sort of alkalosis going on in the blood, which leads to vasoconstriction? Probably early on here, they're increasing CO2 levels in the blood. So what does an increased CO2 level lead to? Acidosis. Acidosis. So acidosis, your body thinks you're suffocating, so you'll get vasodilation. So that will enhance perfusion in the brain. So that's working for you. But 20 watts per minute, it just keeps coming. And then, you know, at some point, the subject is perhaps moving towards hyperventilation. And you're expelling the CO2. You're inducing alkalosis. Another thing that we think is going on is that if you remember the muscle, it's plateaued, so there's obviously lactate buildup. So lactate could be used potentially as a substrate. So your attention and focus just to maintain the pedaling is a metabolic demand, and this increase in deoxyhemoglobin could reflect the really active focus and attention that the cortex is providing to organize everything just to keep you on the bike and pedaling. So really intriguing stuff that you can measure. This is a correlative study where we can see with end tidal CO2, we can see in that last stage of exercise, the end tidal CO2 dropping, tending to support this idea that those patients are moving into a, hy a hyperventilatory state in that last part of the exercise. Another thing that we're interested in is how we can use oxy and deoxyhemoglobin uh, to understand working muscle and potentially to use this as a guide for rehabilitation um, after injury, where we may not want to put a heavy load on a joint, but you want to actually build muscle around the joint very quickly. So we have what's called a dynamometer. Uh, that's essentially like um, um, you know, a device, uh, resistance device that you might see in the gym but it actually has a variety of controlled movements associated with it, very specific angles, and also measures the amount of force that the subject can generate. Um, and so here we have a probe on the knee. Uh, we also have brain probes, and we're looking at kind of the interplay between the two. So what we're doing in these studies is we're adding another twist. So we have a cuff occlusion during these exercises. So we're going to do blood flow restriction. So what we want to see is whether or not blood flow restriction during a load-bearing exercise changes how the muscle responds, and could this be a technique to induce muscle hypertrophy, to change actually the outcome for subjects. So here's what, if you're working out and you have a probe on your muscle, this is oxyhemoglobin, this is deoxyhemoglobin. So here you're resting, here's a set of exercises, you see a drop in oxyhemoglobin, then you rest, and there's reperfusion 
So everybody's experienced this in any kind of load-bearing exercise that's repetitive. When there's reperfusion, then you see a drop in the deoxyhemoglobin. So during work, an increase in deoxyhemoglobin, because muscle is extracting oxygen, and then you rest, reperfusion of oxygenated hemoglobin, drop in deoxyhemoglobin, and this continues for every cycle, every set, multiple repetitions. But if we put a cuff on, you still see the reperfusion of the oxygenated hemoglobin, where actually this is a cuff that's only at pressures that are sufficiently high to impede the venous return. So we're just shutting down the venous return. What we see is a buildup of deoxyhemoglobin in the compartment. So the deoxyhemoglobin remains persistently elevated throughout all the sets, even in the rest periods. So why is that potentially good? Deoxyhemoglobin itself can induce angiogenesis. We're trying to revascularize or trying to improve the vascular structure, the delivery, the perfusion long term to muscle. So persistently elevated levels of deoxyhemoglobin can lead to remodeling that can improve perfusion and vasculature in muscle. And now we're doing outcomes based studies where we're putting subjects through training techniques and comparing to DEXA scans, which are sort of the gold standard x-ray based technique to look at muscle mass and also looking at dynamometer measurements. So the last part I want to talk about is uh, a lot of these studies I'm just showing you hemodynamics. But I started out by showing you this, you know, the spectra where we have lipid content, water content, and potentially more stuff. So how do we get better information about all of these spectral features in between where we have discrete lasers that are available to intensity modulate or pulse. And the way that we do this is we combine frequency domain approaches, which are using laser diodes at discrete wavelengths with broadband steady state or time independent spectroscopies. So if I have a white light source, a broadband source, and a spectrometer, I can measure how the tissue reflects all those wavelengths. But I can't be quantitative about separating absorption from scattering at all those wavelengths. However, if I have a kind of a guide star, I have the frequency domain measurements, and I can then explicitly measure scattering at all those wavelengths. I can then convolve that with DC reflectance. So these are known values. These DC reflectance values are relative. If I combine the two mathematically, I can get a full absorption spectrum and a full scattering spectrum. And so that's basically what we've done with this technology. So this is broadband diffuse optical spectroscopy. In this handpiece, we have a combination of the frequency domain part and the broadband reflectance spectroscopy. So if you take this probe and you scan it, for example, across a tissue and there's a subsurface heterogeneity that has a different spectral fingerprint then when you encounter that, that structure, you're going to see the contrast change. So here, this probe, this is an animation, but this is actually exactly what happens. When the probe goes over a tumor, we see an increase in water. We change the water to lipid ratio. We see changes in the oxy and the deoxyhemoglobin, the total hemoglobin in tissue. And we're applying this in studies in breast cancer. So there are two broad areas both detection, and primarily here we focus on mammographically dense tissue. So pre- and perimenopausal women, high-risk subjects, where mammography does not work well. Mammography actually works very well in postmenopausal women. But in this population, it doesn't work very well. And also in guiding therapies, and in particular, what we call pre-surgical neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That's a mouthful for just saying some patients who have cancer get chemotherapy first, and then they have surgery second. And that's an increasingly done technique. So these are images that are built on point scans. So you put the probe on the patient in all of these locations. And in every one of those locations, you get absorption and scattering over 1,000 wavelengths. So an image is formed from a contrast element. So since we have all those wavelengths, we have a lot of different contrast elements to choose from.
I could make an image just of 932 nanometers, but that wouldn't be very useful. I couldn't talk to a radiologist if I'm talking about a 932 nanometer contrast image. What, they, what physicians want to know is, what's the oxyhemoglobin image? And this is an oxyhemoglobin image of a patient. This is the same patient, one tumor, same patient, but this is contrast coming from all those spectral measurements. So you see oxyhemoglobin is elevated here. This is a water contrast image. So there's substantially increased water contrast. And these are the normal side, the contralateral normal side. Deoxyhemoglobin is elevated. And the lipid is actually suppressed. As the tumor grows, it moves lipid. It displaces lipid. And that creates a contrast. So we, we can create indices. And this is probably you know, our most powerful index which we imaginatively call the tissue optical index. We're still, we could probably come up with a better name for that. But this is a combination of deoxyhemoglobin times water. Both of these components are increasing in tumors, divided by lipid, which is decreasing. So we can get contrast that could be anywhere from a factor of 2 to a factor of 20. It's a very, very high contrast function. And it's all based on endogenous contrast. There's no exogenous agent injection. Those are all just molecules that your body has that are changing in abundance as there's a transformation from normal to malignant. And we're using this to look at ways to predict outcome. So I talked about before with the brain monitoring, you want to see the future for a patient. And ideally, you would like to see it in a powerful enough way that you could intervene and literally change the outcome for the patient. So here's a patient where we're following her. This is from baseline. And you can see some metabolic signature associated with the areolar complex here, which is quite normal, we see. This is a metabolic signature associated with the tumor. And this signature is changing over the course of time. We follow these patients for six months, from pre, from baseline to post-therapy, just before surgery. When they have surgery, they take the tumor out, a pathologist or what's left of it, will look at it and say, there is a little bit of residual disease or there's no residual disease. If there's no residual disease, that's called a pathologic complete response, PCR. And our goal... That's our clinical outcome. So what we're trying to do is see whether or not the change in this tumor to normal tissue optical index from baseline to the midpoint of therapy is sufficiently great to predict PCR, the clinical outcome for that patient. So this is one patient. Here's another patient where you can see there are changes, but they're not obviously as significant. This is the primary endpoint. And this is actually now, it's a multi-center, national multi-center trial that we've just finished enrolling 60 patients in with instruments in seven different sites in the country. And we're analyzing the data right now, looking at the outcome. It's a really hard study to do because we have to build the instruments, standardize them, train people all over the country, and then get patients enrolled in the study each site has to follow patients for six months. But these are the kinds of studies that we have to do as a community in order to answer that question. Is our measurement good enough to change clinical outcome for patients? So we're looking at a variety of other signatures as well. You might ask, is there an early signature as that patient gets chemotherapy that could be used to predict outcome? And what we've seen, going back to this whole issue of vascular reactivity, a number of things impact vascular reactivity. An inflammatory response, chemotherapy can induce changes in vascular reactivity. And what we've seen is that just the very first day following chemotherapy, patients who are responders tend to have a flare response. So there's an increase in the oxyhemoglobin, both in the intensity and the spatial extent. So that's kind of like seeing a perfusion effect going on. What is the biologic origin of that? That's something that we're trying to understand. But what's interesting, it's related to vascular reactivity. Vascular reactivity is good in the case of tumors because it means 
the reactive vasculature can help you get chemotherapeutic agent to the tumor more effectively. If the vasculature is not reactive, if there's high osmotic pressure in the tumor, you can't adequately perfuse that tumor with drug and the patient will not respond. You may have the best drug in the world, but if the plumbing doesn't allow you to get agent into the cancer, then the patient will not respond. So this is kind of a perturbation. It's a ping that allows us to see the reactivity of the tumor. What's also very interesting is that patients who don't show this reactivity, this is even more powerful in predicting non-responders, which is something that oncologists would really like to know because 20% of patients who have chemotherapy do not respond to it. So if you could know that within a day, it can change entirely how you, you treat that patient. I talked about those studies in the brain looking at oxygenation before those patients went into surgery. We've been doing a similar thing with chemotherapy. We can measure oxygenation in the tumor before the patients get chemotherapy and try to predict the outcome of the chemotherapy. And we get pretty good sensitivity and specificity, about 70%, just on oxygenation alone. So if they're less than about 76 or 77%, that's our cutoff value. It's very likely that those patients will not respond to chemotherapy. If it's higher, those patients will respond. And if we just combine this with a simple biomarker, ER status, that's a uh, standardly done tissue molecular subtyping in all of breast cancer, we can move up to 90% or so sensitivity and specificity in predicting outcome. So those are also very important opportunities. Take an optical measurement, use other molecular types of biomarkers that are widely available and under development, and we can even do better. Many people talk about risk, and we would also like to be able to predict risk of disease. In breast cancer, we know that mammographic density is associated, high density is associated with a four to six fold increase in risk of developing breast cancer. But um, mammography is not um, an easy measurement to do. I mean, it's inexpensive and widely available, but it's painful. People don't like to have mammograms all the time. So what if there were an approach where you could measure mammographic density, but do it non-invasively, without breast compression, and get quantitative information about biochemical composition at the same time? So that's what we've been trying to do with optics. And here's a patient. This is just a region of a scan. You see the areolar complex. This is the same patient after density changing chemotherapy, and you see a significant drop and alteration. These are images of water content in breast. So a change in the water at the areolar complex, a change in the breast matrix, the parenchyma of the breast. These are the corresponding MRI images, and you can use 3D MRI and techniques that have been developed here to determine actual fibroglandular density in 3D. And we've been able to correlate the water content with fibroglandular density and the deoxyhemoglobin content with fibroglandular density, and they, they're actually quite linear. They match up very nicely. These are for multiple patients. So we're now using this as a way of trying to assess breast density, but we're doing it in a very targeted type of study. How many of you are familiar with tamoxifen? Tamoxifen. I'll pick on Michael. What is tamoxifen used for? It does. So it's used really widely in cancer management. What it does is actually, it changes your risk of developing breast cancer. It shuts down the ER pathway. So it's an estrogen receptor modulator that changes your body's sensitivity to estrogen. So estrogen cannot be used to promote the growth of breast cancer. So it's used in high risk subjects and millions of women take tamoxifen. It's been a really amazing drug, spectacular drug. But interestingly, as all drugs are, it doesn't work for everybody. And there are significant side effects to it in some cases. Some people just take it and don't have any side effects. Some people take it and have lots of side effects. And then 
Does anybody know how long you take it? Five years. Five years is kind of the old recommendation. Now it's being recommended to be taken for 10 years. So let's just say five or 10 years. So if you had to take a medication for five years, you would like to know if it's working for you. So potentially, so a big study came out where people did mammography and they found that in patients where tamoxifen actually had a protective effect, this was a 10 year study, where there was a protective effect, breast density on mammography changed significantly. But patients who had recurrence of breast cancer, there was no breast density change. So what we're trying to do is use optics as a way of following whether tamoxifen is inducing a breast density change. So that could potentially be a bedside point of care approach to assess the outcome and predict whether or not individuals should continue taking tamoxifen. And then you could potentially extrapolate that to, to risk, uh, but those are much, much more difficult studies to do. So to do that effectively, rather than scanning a small area, you would want to have a, lar a whole breast scan. And so recently we've been able to do whole breast scans using these optical scanning approaches. These currently take a little too long. So we're trying to, so the, these scans take a, about an hour to do on each side. So we're trying to improve the acquisition time, changing some of the strategies of how we get all this data. But clearly if you, this is an oxyhemoglobin image, this is a water image, uh, clearly there's a huge amount of information content there. And you can see the metabolism of the areolar complex in, in all of these. And this is kind of the last interesting thing. Uh, we've, we're very interested, as I mentioned before, in muscle, but we're also really, really interested in fat. Fat is somewhat unexplored because it's hard to measure, but there is metabolism in fat, and uh, it's widely available in most people. So these are some studies where we're looking at weight loss. So again, think about weight loss. You know, people are trying to lose weight, and these are morbidly obese patients. So these are, these are uh, patients who are going to go onto calorie-restricted diets. But regardless, whether they're morbidly obese or just, you're just trying to lose weight, you would like to know if your dietary intervention is, is working. Now, of course, you, you can get on the scale, <laughs> and you can see that. But you know your metabolism is changing before your scale is changing. So the, here's, some, here's one patient where we have the, the full absorption and the full scattering spectra, and we're making maps of their abdomen. And you can see that here we are, the baseline. There's a very beautiful lipid peak. In fact, these look very much like our breast cancer scans, our breast scans. There's a very nice lipid peak. There's the water peak, and you can see that oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. This is the deoxyhemoglobin curve. This is fairly low, so lipid doesn't have a lot of hemoglobin. But six weeks on a, on a calorie, a heavily calorie-restricted diet, there's a significant change in the spectrum. So the water to lipid ratio has flipped. And look at the scattering spectra. So here's baseline, lower scattering, slightly flatter spectra, characteristic of big, uh, juicy adipocytes, <laughs> large adipocytes. But with this calorie-restricted diet, they're actually shrinking. And you see a change in the scattering spectrum that's pretty dramatic. And that's consistent with the functional physiology that we measure. And th these are the maps. So imagine you could show this person baseline, three months, what if we could show after a few weeks that there are these changes that are ongoing? It's a great way to have motivation and to continue with these types of things. Plus, there's a huge amount of really interesting biologic information buried in these signatures that could potentially give insight into lipid metabolism and why people lose weight and why some people can't lose weight or have difficulty. So let me try to summarize everything. We're measuring hemodynamics and composition using these methods. This allows us to localize subsurface inhomogeneities or structures, measure perfusion, metabolism, fluorescence. We can use this in tumor characterization, wounds, injuries, or 
muscle, fat, lipid, and so forth. There are a number of perturbations that we can do, occlusions, we can do functional activation. I didn't show really any of that, but you, there are many ways to probe brain function using these approaches, uh, looking at drugs, radiation therapy effects. So fundamentally, we, we know from population studies that some people respond to medications or interventions and some people don't. So these types of approaches allow us to begin to get to individual physiology, both for detection, diagnosis, assessing risk, looking at therapy response, guiding surgeries. So essentially what we're talking about are techniques for point of care medicine and personal health care. And that's really where I see a lot of these approaches going, particularly as the technologies become more miniature, more powerful, and are easier to access. A lot of people to acknowledge. <laughs> the ones in bold are st still here. The ones not in bold are, are, are former members of, of the group and collaborators in these two particular areas, DOSI imaging and SFDI. And you'll hear from Albert next. And hopefully, he, I guess he won't have the flashing problem. <laughs> and uh, we've had a variety of, of funding sources to support this. So thanks for your attention. Let's, we was, do we still have time for questions? OK. OK, let's open the floor for questions. So it seems like um, you've kind of done, I don't want to say everything, but a very wide range um, with diffuse optics. Uh, what, is there anything that you haven't explored with this that you want to? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. You know, what I think is quite interesting and what you sort of get the flavor from, but I'll try to put all this together. Um, in the molecular medicine world, there's a lot of interest in metabolism. And metabolism is a sort of mediator of a variety of diseases. So aberrant metabolism, metabolic syndromes, being the underlying cause of diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, cancer. So there, within each one of those fields, people are looking at metabolic pathways. And there are a lot of common features to all these pathways. And um, so rather than saying, you know, talking about what I would like to do in individual locations, what I would really like to do is use these types of studies to help put a more universal framework around metabolic syndromes and metabolic disorders that could give us better insight into the risk of developing cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, because we have looked in all of those. We've looked at Alzheimer's disease in mouse models and seen dramatic changes in vascular reactivity, in endothelial cell function, in ENOS and NNOS activity. All of these diseases have common characteristics. So it sort of seems to me that we can use these methods to try to help put together a more unified theory of metabolism. And let me give you an example in breast cancer. So we know in breast cancer, there's sort of this loose correlation between body mass index and breast cancer. We know that fat is not thought to be a good thing to have. But no one has really been able to figure out what the sort of molecular smoking gun is. We know lipid is bad. What if you could take lipid-reducing compounds like Lipitor, which is for heart disease, could that protect you from breast cancer? Well, people have speculated on that, and they've had kind of incomplete conclusions. So just recently, there's a group at Duke that's, that's done some studies that have shown that your own metabolic pathways for degrading cholesterol, getting rid of cholesterol from your body, if there's some aberrant aspect to that metabolism and you start to build up hydroxysterols, oxysterols, like 27-hydroxycholesterol, which is a metabolic product of the breakdown of cholesterol, normal, that's what it's there for. But you may have alterations in certain genes that are responsible. These are the, C, uh, the cytochrome P450 family that are responsible for degrading these compounds. If that leads to an accumulation of those molecules, 
then your body, ironically, makes those molecules that act as serum agents, and they take the place of estrogen. So you may not have your tumor being promoted by estrogen. It may be getting promoted by your body's own attempt to break down cholesterol. So there's a lot of really interesting sort of molecular work going on that are looking at where lipid metabolism, your normal lipid metabolism, may be a little abnormal. <laughs> and it may lead to the accumulation of agents that could be promoting cancer growth or promoting neurodegenerative effects. And so uh, my intuition is a lot of it is related to these lipid metabolism uh, processes. Um, so what I would like to do is do a better job of trying to connect some of those dots. Um, as most many, I think all of you are in biomedical engineering. You know, that's an integrative field where a lot of this type of thinking is going on. And so I think it's a, it's a really good field for being able to solve those questions. Whereas sometimes in individual disciplines, they don't see the connections between all of these things that are happening. But because we're working in cancer and heart disease and diabetes, and you begin to see these common threads of investigations in metabolism. And I think optical techniques, regardless of whether they're these diffuse optics techniques or coherent techniques, they're all measuring similar and interrelated phenomena. And I think the clues are all there. So that's where I see the big challenge. Thank you. But that's going to take a lot of people really kind of coming together and sharing their experiences. You know, like when I hear Vadim Bachman talk, he has a particular way of seeing his data. And I have another way of seeing it. And we actually were talking about this a few weeks ago at the Gordon Conference. I got, just from his data, different insight from what he saw. And I think this is one of the, it's a classic reason to share your ideas and to, you know, interact with people, make networks, because these are tough problems. But I think in biomedical engineering, we tend to take on really impossible problems, and, and that's, that's a good thing. Hi. Thanks for a great talk. I had a question about your uh, breast cancer device, uh, monitoring device. Um, and uh, there, it's a two-part question. One is, um, is there any depth information we have? I know you do monitoring, so you, you have a priori information of where the tumor was. But is there a limitation as far as depth is concerned? And um, you initially showed only partial uh, breast scans where you're not uh, seeing and you later on address that you're doing the whole breast scan so if there is a recurrence somewhere else probably uh, you could look into that but how small if there is a recurrence of that could you catch and secondly if you have I mean do you have any techniques for calibrating your instrument or validating um, maps that you're seeing for example for water maps and all so. yeah so good question so on the the breast cancer studies those studies are all focused on what I consider to be the lowest hanging fruit problem. So pre-surgical neoadjuvant chemotherapy is only done for locally advanced disease. The minimum inclusion requirements are two centimeter diameter tumors. So they're all palpable two centimeter tumors. The patient's in a reclining geometry. So we see all the tumors. There's really big contrast uh, between the, those are large tumors. So we're not trying to find small tumors. We're trying to look at small changes in big tumors, which is a really interesting way to look at it because if I tried to find a small tumor, I could be working very hard. And if I tried to find tumors that are growing in people over time, just a one centimeter tumor, depending upon the tumor type, it, it might be growing over a 15 to 20 year period. So rather than trying to take snapshots of the growth and evolution, of a tumor over decades, we want to actually look at the physiology of a tumor that's disappearing in six months. So we're getting a lot of information from that. What's the minimum residual disease we can see? Well, typically, you know, when the pathologist looks at it, we can see five millimeter residual disease, but not in everybody. So it depends. Why are we doing multicenter studies? Well, um, there's physiology that's different all around the world. We're finding that um, uh, uh, many, uh, so we have two instruments in Asia. M there's a lot more breast density in Asia 
density doesn't impact our ability. In fact, so one of the cool things about these methods is that density is just physiology. And then if there's tumor physiology on top of that, we can see that perturbation. Um, in terms of calibration, um, well, oh, and also time. Why are we, so it's, it is about time. It takes us about a second or two for every, every spot, a couple seconds for every spot. So we move it around point by point, um, and we're working on advancing the technology so that we can just go zip, 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 zip. Uh, maybe next summer we'll show you that. And <clears throat> using sort of some concepts from the gaming industry to actually be able to do rendering and visualization in, in real time. Um, so then we can get to the whole breast scan. In terms of quantitation and validation, so, you know, we're absolute with respect to phantoms, so we make a lot of phantoms. Um, and we're consistent comparing one individual to the next. What is an absolute measurement is a really tough thing to actually say because we make approximations for the tissue in our mathematical model, so we're not truly accounting for partial volume effects. So in order to, so we're measuring a tumor and the impact of the tumor on the tissue. So we're not measuring exactly the confined volume of the tumor. So we're measuring the extent that the tumor is perturbing the tissue physiology. So the partial volume impact will depend on the tumor size and extent and the field of view of the probe. So we're not accounting for that in any of these things. So that's actually the good news. So we're underestimating contrast. The actual contrast is even greater if you were to be able to account for partial volume. All imaging techniques have partial volume effects. Um, so how do we conquer that? Well, we have to have multiple views of the tissue and a different mathematical model to invert the information content. But we've made the decision not to do that with these studies because it takes more time to get the data. So we're trying to balance between data acquisition time and analysis time and doing a multi-center study. So all those, but all those things are, are to come. So in the future incarnation, we account for partial volume. We zip, 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 visualize everything instantaneously. But that, that could keep us busy for a while. Um, about tamoxifen. Tamoxifen was the first such drug, and now there are at least two more, I think, that are felt to be better. Have you thought of using those drugs in your, in your studies? Absolutely. Um, so this particular study is a very focused kind of clinical pro, uh, uh, trial that's focused on, on tamoxifen, but the aromatase inhibitors are a, whole, a different class of compounds uh, that act in a different way. Rather than binding to the estrogen site, uh, they actually interrupt the body's biosynthesis of estrogen that comes from testosterone. So they're all sort of androgen interrupters. Um, and uh, definitely. So there's just so, there, maybe that answers your question. <laughs> there's so many things to do with that. Um, but there be similar effects sure. in, in density changes. The implications of the aromatase therapies, um, so those are primarily given to more postmenopausal subjects. Um, so premenopausal women will get the tamoxifen because they are typically still producing lots of estrogen. And um, you can synthesize estrogen and drive those receptors even in a postmenopausal state by, by essentially metabolizing the other androgens. And so those, that's the goal of the aromatase inhibitors. Again, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a lot of questions on the multi-central um, clinical trial, but I think that we're going to talk off live. And then again, um, yeah, so when I see your data, it gave me a lot of insight on how I treat our current data in the uh, Batman lab and, and then the old data in the Vanderbilt with Anina. So yeah. it's really a big feel. And then working the, all the group kind of data going to you know, help us to better understanding our old problem or our, our current problem is real. I have a, a, a very big question 
So you came from the field, you came into the field 30 years ago, do a lot of things. There are no market, so right now we have a big market. So here we are again, all young people enter into the field, just like you 30 years ago. So what is your advice for us? Like, uh, yeah, working harder or <laughs> drink more, like us all do, drink more and socialize. But uh, what is your advice for us? It's a really, I don't, we didn't talk about this before, but I just gave a talk last week at the NIH at a special symposium that was for new investigators. And they asked me to actually talk exactly about that. <laughs> so, um, so what I did was uh, I got a bunch of my old slides and old pictures and kind of showed things. And really kind of the, the, the bottom line to this is, so 30 years ago we, we had, and when the Beckman Laser Institute was built, it was, it was built with an investment of a hope or anticipation that something great could happen. But none of these technologies existed. And I guarantee you that the people who were putting it together actually had no idea about what any of these technologies could do or what would emerge. So, so we're doing stuff now that was not on anybody's radar screen 30 years ago. And, and so why did all this happen? It happened because people had confidence that great things would happen in the future, that stuff is unpredictable. So for sure, when you're giving talks in 30 years or 25 years, what you're going to be talking about was you didn't predict it. It just somehow you have to just keep pushing the envelope in what your field is. So, so that's kind of the key. And maybe Jerry can help validate some of these things because he has an even broader perspective than I do. But the only thing that we do know for certain is that what you're going to be working on in the future is, and the big breakthroughs are very difficult to predict. So you, we need to ensure that people do have opportunities to do that. And so that's kind of the big sort of address at the NIH that we had which was make sure that young people are able to really get into the field and do what they want to do. So all this stuff that you see is because people were able to do what they wanted to do, what they felt like was important, what they were passionate about at the time. And you have to give people the opportunity to be creative like that. So in some sense, the only thing that I have confidence in is that all of you are going to know you're going to, you know, you develop your excitement about certain areas. You develop a passion about the kinds of things you want to work on. And that's the thing to invest in. It's not so much the sort of technical fl fine splitting of the ideas. It's really more about you guys, your training, your interest and excitement in pushing the envelope. So keep taking, you need to take risks. It's extremely important to take risks. I know it seems a little counterintuitive when you hear about funding and it has to be in safe areas and you know, be careful about that. But fundamentally, you need to be pushing the envelope and taking risks on ideas because that's how these things end up 30 years later with unexpected applications, unexpected technologies, and, and unexpected impact. It's hard to actually chart a roadmap like that. So it's more creating an environment, being in an environment that will allow you to do that. So the supportive environment is very important. So the growth of this, this field, I think, is very much aligned with the growth of institutes like ours, the Wellman Labs, the growth of programs at universities all around the country, investing in biophotonics all around the world. Actually, probably if you look in Germany, they, they may have the highest density of investment in biophotonics anywhere in the world. So this has been a huge driver for all of this. And our field, I believe, with its applications in biology and medicine, is in many ways just beginning. We're we are really at a very early stage of trying to unravel all of this sort of mystery that's related to metabolism, biology, physiology, and then outcomes in treating patients. So that's where, you know, you guys have to keep pushing on because there's so many new techniques. I mean, you have the ultimate flexible platform. 
Optical methods are reconfigurable in every possible way. Everything from time reversal, you know, and coherent imaging to looking at multimodality approaches, generating additional acoustic or thermal information from optical interactions. There's just, it's, there's so much stuff. So go out there. <laughs> but I, again, you have to talk to other people, I think, who are maybe less optimistic and enthusiastic than me to get a, bounter, uh, a counter opinion. <laughs> okay, I think with that we should close uh, the first session. Let's thank Bruce.